Welcome to a Love Ignites Peace book club podcast. We are so thrilled to have you joining us tonight, especially thrilled to listen to this book that we have read this last month. It is another good one. I really feel like we've had two good picks in a row, but let's see what everyone else thinks. First of all, hello, everyone. It is great to have everyone back. We missed Jenna last month. So good to have you back, Jenna. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. <laughs> Also, I'm feeling zen today because I just got back from a yoga class. So hopefully this is a good one for me. Calm, cool, and collected. <laughs> I had two hours of yoga right before this too. As well. Oh my goodness. Two, two hours. hours. Wow. I know. Back to back. Well, I have big expectations for both of you now. Let's check in with everyone. How's everyone doing? Anyone have any quick updates that you'd like to share since the last time we all gathered for a book club podcast? It just seems like time sped by. So much has happened. I can't even pick one thing. How about you girls? I don't think I have anything either. Just we're winding up the last, I think we have two and a half weeks of school left. So just winding that up. I have kind of a cute story that's not about me, but it's about Martin's mom. So I've talked about on the book club podcast, Martin, my boyfriend, his mom is a super sweet lady. We're really close and she is a baker. So she worked... After his family immigrated here, she worked at Vaughn's for 20 years. She was the bakery manager there, and then she retired from that job and then has since, in the last couple of years, taken up baking again and is trying to kind of kickstart and launch her own business. So for the last year, she's been doing that. And a couple of weeks ago now, well, it was a couple of months ago, actually, when I saw her, she was telling me that she really just wanted to kick her business into gear. She wanted to make more money from the clients that she was having. She wanted to do bigger events. She wanted to do weddings. And I told her this was right after we had read Becoming Supernatural by Joe Dispenza. And I had told that story on the podcast. And I took a picture of my sheet pertaining to all the things regarding my job. And I told her, I really think you should do this exercise, like write it in a journal and then just manifest it and make your dreams come true and so i was kind of helping her she's like what do i write and she is a, a spiritual lady but i was like just write everything write what you want like write what you want for this business and so fast forward the last couple of weeks she has been so busy the orders are off the chart she has like four thousand followers on instagram which is huge for like a small little local wow. Wow. business she just got her biggest order ever. It was a $3,000 order. So, and I mean, and it was a lot of work, wow. but she's just talking about how she's like, I did one event and it was $3,000 and this person's introducing me to their friends and she gave out their business cards. And the craziest thing about all of it isn't just that this happened, but it's the number $3,000 is so significant because I remember when she was doing her activity, I was like, you need to go back and look because I remember, I was like, do you remember what you wrote down? And she's like, no, what, what did I write? I've been looking at it every day. And then she was said, sh she hadn't actually written this part down, but when we were talking about it, she was like, I want to do a big event, like something like $3,000. She said that oh, wow. exact number and fast <laughs> forward, she had her first event where she brought in $3,000 by making all these desserts. And so it was really cool. And I mean, his parents, it's obviously not totally my story to tell, but what is really cool about his family and this is they immigrated here with nothing like 25 years ago. So I think that's a really, really powerful, impactful story that this kind of stuff is available to anyone and it, it, you really can manifest the life of your dreams. Oh, that's awesome. Look how the book club is making an impact not only in our lives, hopefully in hopefully in our listeners' lives, but it's helping your in-laws make an impact in their lives, Jenna, just by what you've learned and passed on. Yeah, and she wants to do another one. She's like, okay, no job, like we're good, we're moving on. Like I want to do one for this aspect of my life. I'm like, do it. It's awesome. And it made me think like what I wanna I wanna do another one for, you know, some other things I wanna make happen in my life. So Super cool. Me too. I love it. Well, you inspired me, Jenna. Yeah, truly. 
Well, you go ahead, Mom. I was going to say, oh, nothing I can think of because we kind of had a big <laughs> thing happen. I was, I know. I was just going to say, I can't believe, Ashlyn, that you forgot about this. But Ashlyn and I did launch another project called the Mamosa Effect. So we are working with women to create peace in their relationships with their moms without ever having a conversation. So like Love Ignites Peace, we have a lot of different tools and things to bring to that process to help to help women. Yeah, we definitely feel so inspired and excited. And I was feeling so inspired and we launched and then I got food poisoning. So that's why I didn't mention it because I've been MIA. <laughs> I've been, I haven't quite been able to show up and mamosa it, but I'm, I'm going to be back soon. I'm excited. We're really stoked and there's a lot of really good things to come and we're actually going to be launching an additional podcast called The Mamosa Effect. So all things mother-daughter relationship and I think it's going to be kind of fun, kind of spicy, really raw and authentic and real between my mom and I. So for everyone listening, you have that to look forward to as well. Stay tuned. Congratulations. Thank you. But with that said, should we get on to the summary of the book? Yes. All right. So the book we read is The Magic of Surrender by Coot Blackson. And this is the summary. After the passing of Coot Blackson's mother in 2017, he discovered that the powerful lesson his mother had been modeling her whole life had always been at the heart of his own teachings. He just hadn't realized it. What was that keen insight? Surrender isn't passive. It isn't giving up. It's strong and courageous. It's about tapping in. Too often we limit ourselves by putting conditions on them. We think we should go a certain way, and when they don't, we hold on to what isn't working, reinforcing what is causing us pain and affirming our lack of trust in the universe. There is another way. We can harness the power of relinquishing control and discover more purpose and meaning in our lives. In this inspiring book, Blacks and Traces, how surrender was a key factor in the lives of so many great people throughout history and shows readers how they can move past self-imposed barriers in their lives to discover the freedom and possibility on the other side of surrender. Yeah, going a little deeper with this summary, he has a formula that he talks about in this book. Surrender plus trust equals magic. And then the formula that most of us live by every day is control plus resistance equals suffering. And this was really the formula that guided his entire book. And the formula that he was trying to get us to to live by. So what did you guys think? Did you like the book? Just like the book? Here's another one of my (laughs) books that you can tell that I love it, how I mark it up. I love this book. Get to that later. I already mentioned it when I introduced the podcast. Yeah. Loved it too. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it. I It was an easy read. It was a fun read, mm-hmm. but the points were so powerful. And I think that this, just the truth in this is so palpable. Paige, mm-hmm. the formula that you just mentioned. The thing that I love about that is those are little nuggets that you can refer back to in life that I plan to turn back to all the time that are so powerful. And just taking that in, I think... For me, the biggest takeaway is that I totally agree with everything that's in this book and I kind of already Uh did. I think it's that good, gentle reminder to course Uh correct during those times that you feel that white knuckle grip on life of like, you need to control the outcome. And if I just do this or do this this way or put in more effort, then I'll get to where I want to be or I, I will get that outcome or hit that goal that I'm looking for. And it just feels so much better and more peaceful to surrender with trust that's an important part Mm -hmm. um and just let life take you on the journey that you're supposed to go on i'm not sure you can really surrender without trust right so that was for me that's always been a motivating factor but on the cover i don't know if you can see on the cover of the book under the title the magic of surrender it says finding the courage to let go And I think when you have trust, you will find courage. Sometimes you think you need courage and then you'll, you'll have trust, but often it's the first something that I really, I really enjoyed his writing. It was a motivational book, a self-help book, but it was such 
a, a beautiful love story of his soulmate of his mom. There were so many books within a book and he wove it all together in such a easy flowing way that you just wanted to keep turning the page. And it was packed with emotion. I think I started crying on page 20. I, I was just bawling. So it, he wove it with emotion and love and respect. Just, he did a great writing job. I loved it. I, I loved his writing. Well, I also loved it. And I thought, you know, with, when you intuitively just know that what he's talking about is a truth, at least a truth for me, I just resonated with the book. And so I love how he wove in, like you said, Teresa, wove in the story of his own life, the story of other famous people that we all know, plus the the story of his mother and father, which was really, I thought, really powerful. And I paused lots of times thinking about their trust, both of his parents' trust, and how they surrendered to their relationship without even being able to speak the same language. I just, it was really hard to put myself in their shoes, but you just felt the flow of that. I really liked this book as well. And I think, as Jenna said, it was just a ton of incredible reminders. I would be curious how it would be received by someone hearing this idea for the first time, but I think it would be liberating and very freeing to know that you don't have to take care of it all. And I really enjoyed reading it in a way that I would, well, at first I would read it 20 minutes. It's kind of all I could do. And I would want to take the nugget take the wisdom and like let that guide my day and let it be kind of this daily practice of like deepening my surrender, deepening my trust, deepening my faith, all of that. But eventually to make it for book club, I had to read a big chunk and I still thoroughly enjoyed that. And I have copious notes that I hope to refer back to. And I think it's just beautiful and freeing. And I listened to the audiobook. And he read it and he did an incredible job reading it as well. And mm. to your point about the motion, Teresa, hearing his voice, feeling his passion, that was really cool as well. Oh, that's a good tip. I I think I might get it on Audible and listen to the rhythm of his and his passion all through the love, the torment, the agony of his break up with his girlfriends and how he kept attracting that's uh, I think the emotion in his voice would really add a beautiful layer so I might just get that on audible thanks for that recommendation it definitely did and he has a really cool voice and a very powerful voice and an excellent cadence and he's mm. a very good speaker so I think it really enhanced the experience as well and I think you'll like it yeah. I don't want to jump ahead, but I was just looking at something that I also wanted to mention because I, I'm sure we'll get to this, but I didn't want to lose it as I'm going through my quotes. I think something that was also really, really powerful about the aspect surrender, I think this quote encapsulates it pretty well. It's early on in the book on the Kindle. It says that page 36, but that's not always accurate. And he says, I had obsessed over whether I was making the wrong move or the right move in my career, in my personal life, constantly stressing out, spending hours trying to make a decision consumed by the thought, what if I let people down? I've got to do life perfectly. I've got to make the right choices. And I can relate to that so much, like so deeply, the verb obsessed over making the right or wrong decision. Like I really relate to that in every aspect of my life. And I'm really, it takes practice for me to surrender and let go and just say, what if, but every job I've ever taken, the college I went to, the places I decide to move, I make those decisions with a lot of scrupulosity. I really think through everything that could go right or wrong. And guess what? All the decisions I've made, especially the ones where it's just like, just see what happens. Those end up being the best ones. It's interesting. You and I are almost opposite. I think I've mentioned before, and I have it on jewelry, but my personal mantra or motto is I, do, I just say yes. I truly do. And for me, I at reading this book, it really is surrender. I don't go to that extreme. I just 
say yes. And to me, that is a surrender. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I I guess all along, I was maybe surrendering in a lot of ways that I didn't really look at it because that is what I was doing. I think that's one of the really cool things about this book and is that surrender itself sounds like a very, I don't know, easy topic, like surrender, you know, you just let go, surrender, kind of like giving up, you turn it over. Those are ways that we've been taught to think about surrender. And this book really expanded that purview of surrender by leaps and bounds. And it didn't Mm -hmm. talk about like saying yes, like what you say, Teresa, but Mm -hmm. it really brought surrender to life in a way that I don't think I've ever read about surrender being brought to life. He had a, I think it was a quote towards the end of the book or his definition type. And it was surrendering is freedom. I think that just pretty much says it all. And you to go with abandon and trust, there is great freedom of heart and mind and spirit involved in that. It's not easy for everybody. I understand that. But knowing that there's freedom of your headspace, of your thoughts, of being so bogged down, that is freedom, you know? Well, that brings us to our next question, which is, He defines surrender over and over in this book. There is not one definition for surrender. There are many definitions for surrender in this book. Mm -hmm. And Teresa, you just shared one of the definitions that really resonated with you. Mm -hmm. Rest of the group, what were his definitions of surrender that really jumped out at you? I really enjoyed on page 43, he says, surrender is not about giving in or giving up. It is understanding that true power comes from partnering with life. So it's that I'm not controlling it. I am surrendering to what comes. So I really liked that. And to go along with that on page 70, he says, surrender is not denial. Surrender is facing reality. I love it. I actually, this ties great with what we were just discussing and going into the definition around surrender. But one thing that I also loved about this book, and we should have asked this question, but we can later if we so choose. I'm wondering what chapter would have resonated most with everyone. Because for me, chapter three, the ultimate improvisation control resonated Mm -hmm. the most. Mm -hmm. It took the most amount of notes. I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. I I see you. I hear you. (laughs) And so my definition of surrender that I really liked was in chapter three, to surrender is to be open to what you don't know. To surrender is to stop trying to force your way. Surrender is the art of allowing so that there is space for the universe to show up. Surrender is acknowledging that you weren't really in control to begin with. Surrender is the art of letting go and letting go to le- leads to more. For me, that's what surrender is all about. It's like, how do I just fully let go and let the divine, mm-hmm. let the universe into my experience? And I feel the most disconnected when I'm having that white knuckle experience but sometimes I don't know how to get out of that white knuckle experience into mm-hmm. surrender, but we can talk more about that later. That's a really good point because like I was saying earlier, it just doesn't feel good to be in that space. You feel like you have to be, and that's the ego, what she talks about a lot throughout the book, telling you, you have to be, it's not mm-hmm. going to turn out the way you want, unless you do X, Y, and Z, unless you plan out this or go to this or tell this person what to do or Mm -hmm. oversee this or micromanage this. And I think when you go back to how it feels, that's why it's counterintuitive because it doesn't feel good. It's like you have to try to check all of the boxes. And Teresa, going back to your earlier point, I was going to use the word freedom. And then you just said exactly that. It's Like what a freeing way to live. And I think it comes back to a practice because the older I get, the better I get at surrendering and the quicker I get to going back to that place of surrender when I recognize that it doesn't feel good to grasp for control. And so I think it's that gentle practice of I'm not great at it by any means, but I'm getting better at Every time I'm catching myself like, you're really trying to control this situation and control the outcome to make it exactly what you want or what you think you want. 
okay, let's turn back in and can we release this and put it in a box to address it later or put it in the box to never address it and just, you know, use these little kind of hacks to to truly surrender. But to answer the question, I highlighted several, so it was hard to pick one. A lot of the ones that I actually highlighted were towards the beginning of the book, but one that I uh, liked in particular is surrender is the invitation to take all limits off of life itself. So magic can happen more than you can imagine, more than you could ever plan, more than you are able to fathom. And when you think about it in that way, it's like, how can you not surrender when you're getting in those moments of feeling like you have to control and not sure how you do that? It's like, no, there's more waiting for you on the other side if you just let go and let the universe do its thing. I love, love, love that definition. And before we move on, I want to respond to something you said before that, which is it's interesting. Sometimes it's a quick, easy topic that can be surrendered like that. I will tell you, it took me this whole book to surrender the (laughs) gripping that I have been experiencing, especially around the launch of our new business. It's interesting how surrender can vary on its ability to drop in. And I did find towards the end of the book, there were maybe a few things that he gave concretely that I'm like, okay, going forward, here's what I can do to help. But anyways, just going back to that, I thought that was an interesting aside that like sometimes we can put it in the box and move on and we find our tools to help us with surrender. It took him beating me over the head with this book. (laughs) I think you're like, okay, Ashlyn, like let it go. Like your ego is saying it has to be done this way. Like you have to just trust. So, but Mm -hmm. back to your quote, absolutely love. Total fave. And last thing, and then I'm going on mute, but this book gets me pumped. It goes back to fear, right? We talk a lot about that, that fear is the antithesis of love. And I think a lot of this control comes from fear, being worried that you're going to make the wrong choice or you're going to go down a road that is is the wrong way and you're not going to choose what's in your highest and best good or what if there's something better out there and it really comes down to fear and trust is the opposite of that fear and i love how he says you can't screw up your life plans if you tried like yeah of course you're going to take some detours but that's the journey that your soul needs to go on in this lifetime like don't think that you even have the power to screw up your life to overwrite the map of the fate of of your life and soul and the universe like you don't have that power and i i that's i think a good thing to turn to in those moments of fear piggyback on jenna's about backing up and life and all of that the one other quote of his was surrender is the knowing that wherever life leads you there is a reason you are ready and life will back you up And that was towards on page 41. I thought that was just a beautiful way he expressed that. Well, we all are here to have experiences and learn from those experiences. So there's purpose in all that we do and all that comes our way for sure. There was one definition that I had picked that no one read. I can't believe it. So here goes. This was one of my favorites. Surrender is not sitting on a meditation cushion. This is inactivity. Surrender is not making excuses for your inaction and procrastination. This is laziness. Surrender is not ignoring your daily needs. This is irresponsibility. Surrender is totally responsibility and commitment to show up, to face life fully. And to me, that just kind of said it all. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Amen. I think yeah. it's so interesting. I I literally loved that one. And I think it's so interesting that the theme overarching was surrender, but we also talk about intuition and love. And going back to what Jenna was saying, the opposite of fear is love. So it's like, no wonder he brought up some of these antidotes to mm-hmm. a resistance to surrender. And anyways, going back to your quote, mom, I love the point that he made over and over and over that surrender is not necessarily just a passive, weak meditation cushion. Not that meditating is weak at all. That's a very strong practice, but it is active. So I think it was really Mm -hmm. powerful. It actually takes intention to surrender. So, you know, set the intention to surrender if this something is something that Mm -hmm. really calls to you. It takes self-awareness. How can we 
let go, or I think Jenna was the one that said you're white knuckling something or when to put something in a box or this or that. Well, that's where some self-awareness just, that's a big thing. Uh, and a lot of people walk around very unaware. Yeah. Yeah. Just an observation on that. Well, that leads us to our next question. I, I completely agree. And the next question is, what are some things you've learned from this book that you wish your younger self knew, right? What are some of those things that you were unaware of or others are unaware of that you wish that you knew and would this knowledge have created a different experience for you? Hmm. I'm going to jump right into that because for me, it is this idea of letting go of resistance. What we resist persists. And I have resisted so many different things in my life. And that resistance has caused me so much suffering. So I really wish that I knew many years ago to just stop resisting and go with the flow. That's a big one. So I was, those of you that are aware of Gene Keys or human design, control is one of the biggest things that I've agreed to overcome in this lifetime. So I wish I knew I didn't have to control it all, that I wasn't, especially everyone else's life, more than even my own. I wish I didn't <laughs> think I had to control everybody else's life so that they turned out the way I imagined them to be. Amen. So, right, right. So, you know, knowing that the universe has my back pulling into another book uh, in another book, but knowing that it's always working out for me and I can't do it wrong, which we just touched base on. I cannot do it wrong. And I would even say that if there were some detours, they were purposefully planned detours to maybe even bring to the surface even more that I cannot control at all. I think I'm still trying to every day learn to let go. It's something that's probably the muscles getting stronger, but I do like things to go in a certain way. I like things that are organized. I, I like my calendar. I can move things around for me. That is freedom where other people look at. It's a control thing. So a lot of it is perspective, our perspective, our family's perspective and life's perspective. And I think we're just all every day learning to surrender, whether we're aware of it or not. Who knew that the book on surrender, although powerful in our own individual journeys, actually would hold such significance in helping other people just have their journey? Because it truly, I mean, that was one of my main takeaways. <laughs> and this is, I mean, it's plagued me for years. Like the number of times someone that I've loved or cared about has made a decision that I've been like, you're driving your car off the cliff. Like I can literally see it. Like, <laughs> and, and I, and I'm screaming and I'm shouting, I love you. Stop. I, you don't have to do this, but that never helps them. <laughs> like, I mean, and it never helps me. The nights that I have suffered, the amount of times I have been kept up because of someone I, because I love so deeply, as I think every person on this call does. I care so passionately and I want the best for those that I love. And so I'm actually going to read this little section because I thought this was really a powerful way to look at it. So again, this was in chapter three again. But he said, I know they feel like mistakes. And this is when he was talking to the man whose daughter was an alcoholic. And he said, I know they feel like mistakes, but this is part of her journey. Your job is to let go of your idea of what you think her life should be. There will be grief and that's okay. It doesn't mean you stop loving her. What I want you to focus on now, it's not just her life as it is today in the struggle and in the pain. I want you to see her soul. Her soul mm -hmm. is perfect. So even though she's doing some of these things that seem so destructive, if you are able to see her soul and see her perfection when she looks at you, she will see you seeing her, not the addiction, not the addicted person she really is. That will be a powerful reminder to her on a very deep level. The greatest gift you can give her is to truly love her and to truly love her is to truly see her. And that perspective shift, I was like, whoa. I think we had this conversation when we read, it was probably when the universe has your back, but it's the same idea. And, you know, it is just allowing that soul to experience whatever they came here to experience. And when we interject, maybe that's for our, for us to learn that when we interject, 
what he say. When you try to control, you end up being controlled. Mic drop. That's so, so mm -hmm. true. Oh my gosh. Right. That hurts. Painfully true. And I like something about what I just read that I like is it gave an actionable thing to do because in those situations, you feel like you need to take action. Like just sitting there doing nothing feels wrong. And it's like, no, your action is to just love their soul, love who they are, who you know they are. And each of the people that I can think about that I have struggled with their decisions are people that I've loved them to the soul level. So as we were reading this, I was thinking about Mimosa effect, like just woven throughout here. But you can, anyway, <laughs> amen. You're so right. Based on what Ashlyn just read, it kind of made me think back on my sister and I, Ashlyn and Paige had asked me to do a podcast. That was like a long time ago. And how, how did I think the question, how do you, how did you love your sister? How did that work? And you guys just were friends and love and, and she was, she died. She died. She was alcoholic. And because I just surrendered to it, I, ju it just, I saw my sister. I wanted to be with her. And I, again, I was fortunate. She wasn't an ugly alcoholic, you know, as some people's experiences. So I was fortunate in that, but I just saw her always. And maybe that's, I wish I would have read this book back then you know anyway so read the book people it's so good i believe Teresa's episode is on season one but i will circle back yeah this would have been a, a really wonderful book to have read years ago for people you know with loved ones that are struggling i think it for yourself to read it and how to navigate things I think a real good challenge for the listeners is if you know someone in your life who is struggling with addiction right now, really take a moment and just accept them as they are and look to see their soul and know that even though they seem to be struggling every day, their journey is still perfect for what they came here to experience. And for those that want to hear Teresa's episode, because it was fabulous, it's season one, episode 29, The Choice to Love Without Expectation. And I'm even just going to read what it was about because I think it ties so closely into what we're discussing, which is what if we could each get out of the way and love people right where they are? In this humbling story, Teresa of Love Ignites Pieces Book Club tells of the unconditional love and trust she shared with her sister who struggled with alcoholism since the age of 13. Their ability to allow each other their own experiences and to support each other without judgment truly exemplifies love six actions. It truly exemplifies mm -hmm. surrender. And mm -hmm. loving her at her soul. And it's so beautiful, Teresa. Mm -hmm. It was, it really was surrender. And I never really looked at it that way until reading this book and some of the definitions of, of it that he brought out. So recommend it. What a beautiful foreshadowing for everything we talked about mm -hmm. in this book of surrender and getting out of your own way. I think for my lesson, there were a lot in here, but... I think the idea of getting out of my own darn way and I have caused so much of my own suffering by just not trusting that things would work out. Like you could say that and I would say, yeah, I believe it. I can't tell you the amount of times my mom would always just tell me, just trust like God is watching out for you. There's a plan for your life. Everything's going to work out. It always does. And when I look back at my life, hindsight is 2020, of course, was there anything that ever didn't work out? No, everything worked out in the beautiful way that it was supposed to amidst every struggle and every curve that built the beautiful tapestry that is my life and my personal journey. But I have gotten in my own way so many times by just really getting anxious that things won't turn out the right way. And when there's a big change coming in my life. So I think this story seems so irrelevant now, but at the time it felt like such a big deal when I was choosing where to go to college, all of my friends seemed to have a pretty easy time deciding you got into the places you got in, where do you want to go? Which one has your major? Which one seems like the best place? I day in and day out 
pro and con list that this school doesn't have the sports scene that I wanted and this school doesn't have the Greek life and I'm going to miss out on this and I want to go out of state because I want to get that experience but then I can't study abroad and then this and it's like endless and it's like nothing's perfect nothing's ever going to be perfect you're trying the reason you're not <laughs> finding the right option is because you're looking for something that doesn't exist like everything's gonna come with good things and bad and i ended up deciding to go to usd kind of regrettably honestly because i was just like I, I, none of like none of these options are right everything is missing something that i want and something that i'm looking for usd doesn't have the big sports school that i want it's in my hometown i don't get to get the college experience and even my first two years at USD, I spent so much time fixating on whether or not I had made the correct choice or if I wanted to transfer, if I could do something better. What a freaking waste of time. <laughs> I met my best friend there. I wouldn't be on this podcast if I had gone there. Like er everything works out. Like you're not, as life progresses, you realize that you were led to exactly where you were supposed to be. And I just wish I hadn't, the word suffering that Paige used earlier is so perfect. I spent so much time self-sabotaging and self-suffering about just making things right or perfect. And I've done that I've, in stories I've told on the podcast with getting a new job. Do I do this? Do I do that? What Like this job has this, but I'm missing out on this. And the grass, like, it's like this grass is always greener, just inability to just realize that life works itself out and surrender and truly surrender, not just say it, but really just like let go and let it happen. Um, I, I'm getting a lot better at it, but it's like, God, why do you waste so much mental energy and time? What a waste. <laughs> Jenna, I'm exhausted listening to all that. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, well, you he, know, it's he, hilarious. Right now, the University of San Diego is calling my phone. I think that's <laughs> a God wing for you, JP. <laughs> That is hilarious. They're asking for money. <laughs> they are. Right? They're like, hey, come spend a lot of money in tuition and also donate right away. Anyways, I I like literally totally get that, Jenna. And I can see that. There's a lot of suffering you've caused in your life. And I have done the same. And I think that there's a flip side to some of that, right? Because we're both, every person on this call, I feel like are very successful, like motivated individuals. So there's a positive to the perfection. But at what cost at times? You could still do a good job, but also be in surrender and in flow. He talks about resistance. And really what we do and what I was thinking about when you were when you were talking about that, Jenna, is that we resist where we are in the moment. Instead of just being in the moment, we we resist that moment and we're like in ten thousand other moments, you know, instead of just allowing this moment to be what this moment is. To mm -hmm. tag off of that, that's been one of my main realizations slash experiences of freedom recently is trying to be 100% resourced and embodied in the present moment. Like that, if I can do that, then I'm in surrender. If I can do that, then I'm at peace. If I can do that, then I experience freedom. But if I'm not doing that, woo, I get pretty into the what's next. I got to control this. I got to do this. Here's my list. So when I was... Uh... At, at times in my life, I've had a lot of fear and uh, many times in my life, not anymore, but in the past, old page did. And I always tried to tell myself once I, once I was a certain point on in my journey and I had this awareness, it was like, what is there to be afraid of in this moment? Like right now in this moment, you're safe, you're fed, you have a roof over your head. What on earth could you be afraid of? Because everything in this moment is just fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think also, I want to find the quote, but there was another thing that was really powerful about just living out your purpose. And it was about the idea of, the quote will do it a lot more justice than I will, but it was about this idea that your purpose is not something to be found. Your purpose is lived out in the day-to-day -day moments of you mm -hmm. just being you and being on the journey of your soul. And I think that that is so, so powerful. 
I found it. So stop. It says literally. So stop trying to find it. Purpose isn't something that you do. It is who you are being. It is who you are becoming moment to moment. Your purpose is every moment of your life. I knew you'd like that. And I totally think that's so amazing for so many people. Cause I, I remember my mom, I mean, I'd be curious what you would say about that mom. I always felt like, you know, there was a while where you were trying to find your purpose and it's like, you finally found that your purpose is in your being. Like in your being as in like your purpose is within you, but it's also in your beingness. It's in your presence. Yeah. It, it was a decision. You know, I'd received the words love ignites peace and I kept thinking, what am I supposed to do with this? Why was I given these words? And it was a big moment when all of a sudden I was like, oh, I think I'm just supposed to live them. Like you wouldn't think that would be such an aha moment, <laughs> but it really was <laughs> like, duh. Yeah. And that's one thing that this book did so well is it's accessible to anyone. Anyone can tap into their beingness. Anyone can choose to live as love. Anyone can tap in to follow that intuition. Like mm -hmm. he, these are things that we as spiritual beings having a human experience can do. This book is accessible. So I think the answer to this next question is probably just an overwhelming round of yes, absolutely. But I'm going to ask it anyway, because I think the point of this question that he made in the book is an important point. The author talks about surrender as a first resort instead of a last resort. After reading this book, how do you feel about this? Are you brave enough to do that? Oh, absolutely. Does it mean I don't take pause? What's happening? Where am I at? That self-awareness is it, it? How, how does it? feel in my body that, you know, we've all read lots of books on listen to your body. It, it knows when it, it's just not right. It, your, our body knows. So I'd like to think I'm stronger and learning and that muscle is better every day for that. Yeah. But I'm a lot older than everybody there. So maybe it gets easier when you get older. You and I've had more practice. Teresa. I've had a lot of practice. Another thing, you know, the saying, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. So it seems like surrender has been coming across my interior screen a lot lately. And so that helps me just build that muscle and put it into play in my life. And so, you know, I've been, as I read, you know, whatever thoughts cross my mind, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm going to let that one go. It's allowing me an in the moment reflective practice of the areas of my life where maybe I need to surrender a little more, you know, because all of a sudden it's really obvious where we're holding on to control and we're like, whoops, even just in those little things, maybe a little interaction or some thought comes across your mind and you start going down that rabbit hole of thinking about it a little bit deeper. And this time I can just really come back to that eternal present moment and let go of it. So reading this book has been that reminder, which has led to other aspects of surrender to show up in my life and keep that going. So I am ready. I'm brave enough. I got my muscle ready and it's ready and primed for a good workout. 100% yes, agree with that on my end. And I was just thinking back on... All of the stories that I think I've told through this podcast that have connected to the book one way or another and a special coincidence has happened or something really cool has happened, I think every single one of those has been at the intersection of me and surrender. From the silly stories that I've told, like me and Ashlyn not having costumes for this concert and me just being like, we're going to find something at the mall, like we're good. And then we like found it. It was great to me quitting my job without having anything lined up and I had spent months applying and getting to final interviews and then not getting a job. And then the second I quit and was like, whatever, like, let's see what you got for me universe. It's like I literally got a job offer without even trying to my current job that I have where I kind I wanted some bigger things out of it and wasn't sure if that meant I should get another job, start interviewing. I just wrote it down and said, whatever you have for me, got a promotion and a raise and a, a bunch of stuff changed at work. It was all right on the precipice of just being willing to surrender. So I think the biggest takeaway is 
for me is how can I just get to that point sooner? Because I always end up getting to that point and it's always like the universe is like, all right, when are you going to let go of the control? And like, we're waiting for you. We have something great in store, like just let go. And so for me, that's the biggest thing is yes, I'm absolutely willing. I want to be able to get to that point quicker than I have been able to in the past. Snaps. Amen. 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 Same goal. I would say it's obviously easy to just say, yes, of course I want surrender over control to be my default. And I think that in the day to day, that's easy to bring an awareness to, but I think the real challenge is in those difficult moments when you are presented with someone making a decision that you really don't think is the right one for me personally, I guess that would be a big one. Or as Coot talks about in the airport when he's being accused of having a fake passport and he starts sending love and dropping in and what would Jesus do in this situation? And so that will be the test, I think. But I definitely know that we all are capable of doing that. And it's something that I I really want to strive towards. I also, side note, had a story that I was thinking about 10 seconds. I feel like I, at times, have been the queen of surrender because my junior year of college, I, like most people, start applying for their internships like September of their junior year. I did not interview. I did not even apply for my junior year internship until the end of May, i.e. I had already moved out of my junior year housing. And I was, I just trusted so deeply. I just knew I was in a time in my life of such faith. And I got an interview at the headquarters of Make-A-Wish. And I literally interned that summer at the headquarters of Make-A-Wish America. And with it was like a really competitive program and they had like hundreds of applicants and I got in at the last minute with like the 10 other 10 to 15 other interns. So again, just that complete and utter surrender and trust. And this was in the description before when we were reading about what the book is about. But like every time you control, you're basically reaffirming to the universe that you don't trust it. So I mean rude like <laughs> like you know like the universe has your back like how can i how can i be a friend with it and be like no i trust you like if i see it more as a friendship it's like i wouldn't do that to my friend like i wouldn't do it to jenna i wouldn't be like nope sorry i don't trust you because i trust her implicitly so how can i maybe see the universe as a friend and help myself in the trust department on that so anyways Oh, I highlighted that one. If I had that in the actual book and not just a Kindle, that would have been highlighted in rainbow colors because I was like, whew, that's a big one. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to say, and this this doesn't answer any question, but it's just an important realization that I had as I was reading this book. There's a chapter about intuition and listening to your intuition. And I think a lot of people struggle with that for me, I feel like I've always had like a pretty strong gut feeling and intuition. But one thing that I really wish, maybe this does answer the question about what you knew, wish you knew when you were younger. Your intuition and having anxiety about something are not compatible. You getting anxious about something is not your intuition saying it's wrong. That is it, anxiety and fear are one and the same. That is not compatible with your intuition. And I just wish that I hope more people know that because that took me a really long time to learn because I'm an anxious person, as you can tell from all the stories that I've told. And I think sometimes because I also have a deep intuition and gut knowing, sometimes they get entangled and it gets a little bit messy. Like maybe I'm feeling anxious because this is trying to warn me about something or it's trying to prevent me from going into something that's going to hurt me or going to make the wrong decision. Or sometimes that gets messy, but I want anyone, everyone to know who's listening to this that your intuition does not work on the premise of anxiety and fear. When you have, even if you are in a an unsafe or a fearful situation, there's that inner knowing of, I should get out of here. This isn't right. Those, that is, it's a, it's a knowing. It's not a questioning, an anxiety of, of kind of playing all the situations out. 
I just want to add super quickly to that, that I did note, this is another really good book to read to explore your intuition a little bit more. I think people mm. have a lot of questions about what intuition is, and I thought he did a very nice job in guiding on what that actually is, what it looks like, what it feels like, how to experience it. Kind of talking about the anxiety and intuition and those type of things. On page, it started on kind of page 69 through 71. The I, I look at it as a bridge towards surrender is when we, and he says, it's an exercise in the power of thanking your past. When we can look back in gratitude, in honor, we can begin to see a not a pattern, but the, oh my God, I, I was taken care of. This did turn out. This was the right thing. That's why I'm here right now. That gratitude of all the things is really a bridge to surrender and to surrender is trust. So I think gratitude and is a key component in all of this personally. Well, we have shared so many incredible nuggets of wisdom. The last question that we had is if you could impart one bit of wisdom from this book to our listeners, what would that wisdom be? I just gave my answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. You that just was gave my it. answer. Teresa might have just given her answer too. I don't know. I think I gave mine. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Well, one of the stories from the book, I think to me, created a visual that was the greatest piece of wisdom that I took away from this book. And that was the story that he told about a surfer and how surfers ride the waves. If a surfer catches a wave and tries to control the wave, what happens to the surfer? You are going to eat it. You know, you're going to skin your face on the rocks of the, on the bottom. I mean, who knows? You're going to tumble, fall. It's going to be traumatic. But if you get on that wave and you just let go and flow with how that wave is flowing, you can ride the biggest wave there is out there and you can ride those waves all the way into shore. And I just thought that was such an incredible visual that really imparted the wisdom. So when you start trying to control and you start resisting, what happens if you're a surfer on a wave and you do that? Nothing good. <laughs> Nothing good. That's right. That's right. Actually, that actually, when I was reading that about the big wave surfer, that reminded me of that reminded me of your skiing story from two podcasts ago, where your whole day skiing really just changed when you shifted from that fear and lack of trust to really just surrendering and having the confidence to take on that mountain. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. That's so true. That's such a good correlation. Mind blown. I would tag off of my mom's into my own takeaway. And one thing that I would like to leave everyone with is to get curious. Get curious, get curious, get curious, because that can help you surrender. How is the situation working for me? Why is this happening for me? What am I to be learning in this relationship? How am I resisting? It's the curiosity that can kind of help lead you to see where you're creating blockages. And I was going to say another piece of that that also goes to being curious is being radically honest with yourself. And he talks about the importance of radical honesty because, of course, I just changed my page where I was looking, but that radical honesty allows you to uncover what your feelings are trying to tell you so that you can kind of end that suffering. Why am I, why do I believe this? Why am I acting this way? And being really radically honest, why you're making the choice that you're making. Am I making that choice so I can control an outcome and manipulate someone or something? Or am I making that choice from a really honest place? And I think if it's, well, if it's causing suffering, it's probably coming from a fearful place. 
And so you have to be really radically honest with yourself about the choices you're making, where you're putting your time and energy, whether or not you are seeing people through the lens of what you want them to be or who they truly are. Are you meeting people where they are or are you trying to force them someplace, you know, I think about as a teacher, you know, I need to meet my kids where they are. When I'm training teachers, I need to meet teachers where they are. But sometimes we don't do that and we have to step back. Why am I trying to force something so that I can control it versus meeting them where they are, surrendering to that so that then from that point we can move forward so that my own suffering isn't caused. I love that. Before we before we go into reading, I want to throw an audible and just share this prayer that he says. And for everyone listening, maybe you could just take a second to just take this in. For everyone on the book club podcast, maybe you could just take a second to take this in. But he said, let's say this prayer together. I surrender my need for control. I surrender the way I think life should be. I surrender my desire that things be different. I surrender. Thank you, universe. I surrender my need to know. I surrender my need to be known. I surrender my need for other people's approval. I surrender my imperfections and need for things to be perfect. I surrender my goals and my desires. I surrender ego. I surrender I. Thank you, universe. I ask that everything that is not in alignment with my highest path to be cleared away. I ask only for the highest good to be made manifest in my life. I surrender everything. Thank you, universe. I surrender. And so it is. So it is. Thank you, Ashlyn, for reading that. I think that was um, a really Mm -hmm. profoundly beautiful way to almost wrap up this podcast. I wanted to make sure we did it before it was too late. So with that said, ladies, let's give this book a rate. One to five, five being the best. Teresa, you're ready. I am ready. Five. Absolutely. I would have this as a handbook. I think it's pretty appropriate for, I would say, definitely ninth grade up for sure. High school, get a jump start on it. It will help you so much. Five, five for me too. I agree with everything Teresa said. And I think this book would be especially powerful for someone who's going through any kind of a life change where there's some uncertainty ahead. I think that this would be a really powerful read for you to find some solace and know that everything is going to work out for you. I also give it a five. I just love the. it was just so beautifully written and so beautifully told and very relatable. So a five. Mama Lama? I am giving it a five plus. I think it raised my vibration when I was reading it. That's 100% for sure. And the stories were so well told, weaving in his point that those stories will come to mind as I sometimes face life in a way that might call for surrender. And I need that reminder. So 100% five plus. It's so funny. I was thinking about giving it a 4.9 because it didn't quite tickle my soul just just as much as Seed of the Soul did. But I mean, it's definitely a five. It's hard to compare because they (laughs) both hold such valuable information and I wouldn't want to discourage anyone. I would want to encourage everyone to read both of those books. So I'll I'll go with a five because it's pretty amazing for us to have a five across the board. I think we did last month too for Seed of the Soul, but Jenna missed that podcast. So we don't know what it would have been if Jenna had given her vote for Seed of the Soul. We'll never know. We'll Unless never know. she reads it. Because 10 out of 10 recommend JP. Woo, what a good one. I was going to say, I thought the same thing, Ashlyn, as I was thinking about rating it. But I, I realized that both books can be a five because they're both really valuable. Even if one, yeah, that they can both. I did struggle with that. A seat of the soul that just, woo. Surrender what, to the five girls. Just surrender to the five. <laughs> I am not resisting. <laughs> That's literally what I was thinking because you guys know every time you were rating, I like really have to think about it because I'm like, well, I didn't like it as much as that other book. I'm like, it was a great book. I loved it. Five, surrender. You guys are hard raters. 
when it comes to it. You're Listen, just we're really the honest truth here. I know mm-hmm. you are. I know you are. We didn't touch at all on the chapters toward the end that talked about romantic love and soulmates and all that. And I really wanted to get your perspective on that because it's been something that you talked a lot about your journey on. So I wanted to see if you thought of all that. It's so funny. I was just thinking that a little bit ago and I was like, no, you don't need to say anything. I I feel like it's where I've gotten to naturally. Like it's, I have been following this flow and the flow has brought me to this place of being radically in love with my life, doing my thing. And not even feeling the need to search. Like I trust, I trust, I trust, I trust. I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. I know my great love will be there at the right time. And I want it to be that love where we're both learning and growing and making each other better. So yeah, I honestly, I think it would have been a bit mind blowing if I hadn't read it at this time in my life. But it's so true. Like you show up and you're like, you want it so badly. Of course, you're not going to get it. That even goes to love money, money loves you. Where Mm -hmm. love money, money loves you shared the energy of money shared that if you say need and want and you're holding it like this white knuckled moment, the energy of money cannot flow to you and it will create more need and more want. And so it's the same thing, right? With with love, it's like, it doesn't mean I don't want it. It doesn't mean I don't like desire that in my life, but like I am radically in love with where I'm at and trusting the flow. So yeah, that's a good question. But I literally wrote exclamation point. This is where I'm at. So love that. Thank you. Yes. I feel so good about it. Ladies, it has been a pleasure to be with you tonight and to hear all of your wisdom and all of your insights from this book. It really, I think, was a very meaningful discussion tonight. So thank you. Thank you all for showing up, for being here, and just being you. Since this is Love Ignites Peace, there was one quote from this book that I would like to end the podcast with, which it's on page 180. It's time to surrender to the love that you are and love fully with nothing held back. This is our calling. This is our destiny. This is the ultimate surrender. So on that note, our book for next time is Maiden to Mother, Unlocking Our Archetypal Journey into the Mature Feminine by Sarah Durham Wilson. And we wish for all of you to have a terrific month and to love with not holding anything back. Love with the entirety of yourself. Surrender to love. Be the love. Love it. Thank you, everyone. And remember, get your freak on.